Hi, welcome to another episode of I Hate It Here, where this is not a podcast, please stop calling it that. Today, we're going to be unraveling the Latinx identity. So here with us to talk about that is our expert panelist. He is the Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Please welcome Dr. Michael Benitez. Uh, here with us also is a political science major. Please welcome Denny Palacios. And then, of course, we have our local community organizer, Amelia Perurico. All right, so thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. I want to start out, before we get really analytical today, uh, and just asking everyone to sort of self-identify. So if we could start with, with you, Dr. Benitez, I'd really like to hear uh, what, is it, what is the term you're most comfortable calling yourself and why? I'm Afro-Taino Boricua. That's how I, I get down. <laughs> Very good. Uh, I am Mexican uh, most of my life. Well, right now at this point, it's half, uh, almost half, but since I was 15, 16, I lived over there uh, in different parts of Mexico. Um, so that's, that's how I identify myself. Amelia? And for me, uh, I use a few words to identify myself. So I, the first term that I use is Mexican-American uh, because I was born here in Estados Unidos, but my family is from Mexico. Um, and I also use the term Latine um, because I'm also queer and, you know, Mexican, and that is um, a term that I feel comfortable with. Excellent. So just for, uh, because everybody else did it, uh, I found a term online, which I'm very comfortable with, is detribalized Mexican, because I grew up in Texas, and um, I was very disconnected from that culture, and I've tried very hard to find the indigenous side of, uh, of my heritage, and it's been very hard, because, well, colonization worked really well. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so now that we've broken that down, I actually want to turn our attention to some more generic terms that it seems like none of us identify as, <laughs> um, so specifically Chicano, Latino, Latina, Latinx, uh, and Hispanic. So uh, mm. Dr. Benitez, can you give us a little clarity on some of these terms and why people keep calling us this? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's, it's wild because, uh, you know, you have a lot of people that make arguments around, call me Latino versus Hispanic. You have some of the OGs or kind of old heads or elders uh, who prefer the term Hispanic uh, over Latino. And the thing is that uh, they're all right and none of them are right, right? Um, in the U.S., the, the, the first terms that were used to try to describe Spanish-speaking people was mother tongue, Spanish tongue, or uh, surname, last name. Right? Then from there in the 1970s, uh, a lady by the name of Laura of Florence Hughes coined the term Hispanic as Spanish speaking as a way to uh, try to identify and capture this large body of people that uh, for some reason they were confused we weren't all brown. Uh, right? It matters. And, and part of it was related or tied to social services in the U.S. And then down the road, then Latino became a, a more popularized term because it describes someone supposedly uh, who has the indigeny, uh, the indigeneity, uh, the, the Afro or blackness element of who they are, uh, as, as, as well as of the Spanish, right? And all that combines for the Latino, but the reality is that Latino was a term that became a term in 1848 by a sociologist uh, uh, by the name of Francisco Balboa, who was uh, trying to, you know, and this is post-independence, uh, when most countries in Latin America started to gain independence from Spanish Portuguese colonialism, uh, came up with a term that was a more kind of romanticized, softer, and he claimed gentler, less barbaric way of colonialism. So the whole thing was an effort to find a continental, a transnational identity that would keep sort of uh, that, that Spanish identity intact in Latin America after most countries broke, uh, broke from colonialism uh, and, and emancipated. Uh, slavery. That becomes just real important to know. And then now you have different progressions, Latinx, and the X means something very particular. And we could, you know, get, get, get into that later. And then we have Latine, which also means something different. But, you know, Latino comes from Latium. Latium is the indigenous word for what is now Italy. Italy has nothing to do with Latin America. Uh, Hispanic describes a Spanish speaker as someone who speaks Spanish. It's not necessarily a culture, so it's all nuanced, uh, complex, uh, and super constructed. 
Yeah, now thank you so much for, for breaking that down for us, my goodness. Uh, <laughs> I want to uh, turn the attention to Amelia, uh, because you, you identify as, as Latin A. Um, mm -hmm. Can you be more specific on what is the meaning to Latinx to you, and what is the difference between that and Latin A? Why, why is one for you better than the other? Yeah, um, so first of all, Latin X in Spanish is not grammatically correct. So you have a word that is not grammatically correct about the group of people that you're trying to speak about. Um, and that word, to my understanding, was very much created in academic spaces, not including you know, people on the ground, people in the communities. So it's in these very higher ups, like very academic spaces. Um, I can't even say the word in Spanish. Like I wouldn't tell my abuelita, I wouldn't say Latinx, she'd be like, que? Because um, it doesn't, it doesn't translate, so it doesn't even, it, to me it doesn't make sense to use it. And so that is why I use Latine, because you can say it in Spanish. And it is a very, it's a very new term. Um, and there are a lot of opinions on it, but the reason that I feel the most comfortable with it is because I haven't yet found another word that is gender neutral in Spanish, but Spanish is a very gendered language, which is also very hard. But then the history of Spanish also involves, you know, a lot of harm sometimes, um, especially in terms of like the way that Spanish came to Mexico specifically, because uh, there was already like indigenous languages there before, you know, colonization. So language in itself is very, very complicated. Um, but the reason, ultimately, the reason I feel the most comfortable with the word Latine is because it is gender, gender neutral, and I am somebody who uses, in English, they, them pronouns, and I am gender queer, gender fluid. Right. Denny, I just want to take it to you. I know you have some thoughts, so I don't have a direct question for you, but, you know, based on your facial expression, <laughs> I feel like you have some things to say. Um, I think I'm just very grateful for these spaces where we get to have these conversations, um, and it, it is very interesting to me uh, as a Mexican that I didn't have to measure how Mexican I was until I got into the country, until I got into the United States. In Mexico, I was just Mexican. I mean, I was just, you know, I would go get tortillas in the morning for the whole day, and that was just part of my experience. Like, I didn't know how a Mexican a tortilla was because it was just a tortilla mm. for me. Um, and it is, it is very interesting that we've been through all of this process of language and, and we live in the continent of American, but they've made most of the country into, they, they work so hard and they went through all of this process to make us into Latine, but America is just the United States when it is the whole country in reality. Um, so. It, Every time I, I sit and I have these conversations with people that are from the, from, from the United States that are unborn and that have ancestry from Latin America, is it's very interesting to see how much we've been, how much has been taken from us to adapt us to the the terminology that it was easier for them. Yeah. That's my feeling too, that you know, a lot of these terms are not self-described terms. It's just they try to lump us in. And, and um, to touch back on the history uh, that, that, that we, we got from you, uh, when I looked at it, um, the term Hispanic originally meant Mexican, Cuban, Puerto Rican. And you know, other than having been colonized and having some version of Spanish, uh, we're really, are we really the same people technically? I mean, what is it? Is it um, is it appropriate, really, to lump us all together like that, or? No, you know, hell no. I, I think that, <laughs> it, it, not, no, it, you know, it matters, right? Like, mm -hmm. the, the thing about Latin America, you know, we're the most transnational people in the world. Mm -hmm. you, you know, we're the most diverse by way of culture, mixes. Uh, you, you know, you tag in colonialism, you tag in uh, indentured servitude, right? Kind of the more optional. I'm from a lower working class, but eventually I'm going to pay my way out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you tag on then sort of the uh, colonialism around uh, indigenous people in what is now Latin America and, and sort of the whole continent. And, and then you stretch that really all the way up to, up to Mexico. And, and it's a real interesting history because no, we shouldn't be clumped, but there's something like real special and powerful. For example, like I identify as Latino politically. So if somebody's like Mike, um, Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, I'm like, nah, 
Latino. <laughs> <laughs> right? It, because I understand that there's a, a certain power in, 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 in collective uh, galvanizing and in, in collective movement. And so it's more a politic for me than it is an actual racial ethnic descriptor. To the extent that we all share a lot of values around ethnicity, a lot of cultura, uh, that's, that's West African, uh, a lot of it is still Spanish, uh, um, uh, regrettably, but it's understandably Catholicism, you know, a big practice, um, speaking Spanish, that, you know, uh, right? Uh, th those are the central elements of kind of, kind of cultural imperialism, right, and settler uh, colonialism. Uh, but then, then you have this piece um, around uh, indigeneity that is still practiced in a lot of places, uh, and, and we don't pay enough attention uh, to those spaces. But for a lot of indigenous people in Latin America, and even when you think about, like, let's say, a moment like 1848, Treaty of Guadalupe, uh, when, hmm. when the, uh, uh, the U.S. truly did cross the border and took over to what is now the southwest of, of the United States, uh, that was a very particular moment because then you had a lot of indigenous people and then you have generations, a lot who were forced to assimilate, um, uh, you know, a lot of them who kind of mark or self-proclaim or self-author themselves as Chicano, Chicana, Mexican-American. But then that looks very different in the Northeast with Boricua or Puerto Rican migrations. And it looks very different in Cuba with those migrations at the time. And now you have uh, uh, an influx of migration from just Central and South America writ large. But when you look at a colorism or a caste system from Spanish America, there were over 100 identities that were also gendered, depending on how much bloodline your mother had or bloodline your father had according or tied to whatever nation, particular Spain, determined your power and hierarchy in society. And while that's not a common practice today, the residues of that colorism and, and, and colonial infrastructure and enterprise still show up in ways uh, that are incredibly evident, not only by way of Latinidad, if we want to use a word to kind of capture it all, but there's so many different arguments. You could even make an argument around the work of like a Jose Vasconcelos who talked about the cosmic race as this third race. Now Hispanic, the way you understand it, actually embodies a lot more than the identities that you provided. Uh, and you can look at the, the work of like a Jorge Gracia philosopher to really understand how that plays out. Uh, and, then, and then lastly, that's why someone like a Gloria Ansaldua then comes in and, and to the point you brought up, kind of queers, right, Latinidad and says, ooh, hold up, not only there's a problem with the way you're trying to describe Latinidad uh, erasing indigenous identities and erasing uh, uh, um, uh, Afro identities within La Cultura, but there's also a gendering element that needs to be addressed uh, that doesn't account for gender neutral or people who identify uh, as, as gender neutral. So I mean, it's just complex and nuanced. This, this topic, uh, this is my dissertation, that's why I know it really well, <laughs> uh, is, is really complex, but it's beautiful. Because at the end, we got to look at, right, you know, I, I, I heard a, a quote recently from, and I'll stop here, from Erica Alexander. A lot of people, the, the old heads in the crowd might know her as uh, Maxine from Living Single back in the day. But, you know, she said, uh, history is painful, a present is precarious, but the future can be free. And that's how I think about Latinidad and the way that we begin to reclaim our identities within those spaces to show up as we are. You know, I'm, I'm glad you touched on that because uh, a thought I had while researching all this is that, um, to put it a, a little less more complex than you did, uh, it seems like even though this is not necessarily terms we came up with uh, ourselves or use ourselves, it does serve as a unifying sort of presence for, uh, for our transatlantic culture. Um, and you can't really have a political movement without being able to identify as something, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, you have to have the, a collective for, for a real strong political movement. So um, I actually want to share something uh, going back to the term Hispanic. Uh, I looked on the US census.gov. Uh, so today, right now, if you look up the term, um, it literally says people who identify as Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish may be of any race. Um, and then you try and look up the terms of uh, what ethnicity and race means, and ethnicity is cultural or ethnic group, group language, religion, or customs, and then race is social group based on physical traits. Not mm -hmm. a not a great thing, but you know, that's very broad. You know, there it's it's uh, at this point, you know, um, 
when I go to check any little box in a, in a census or in some sort of uh, survey of some kind, I always check different things because I'm like, none of this is really me. This is not at all how I identify. Um, and I haven't checked Hispanic in, in quite some time. Uh, what are some of your thoughts on that? I think, <clears throat> just to bring it back to what I was uh, saying, like we are such a broad population uh, and there is so much power and in El Sabor that, that we bring. Um, <laughs> you know that it is, it is inappropriate for us uh, as this broad population, or at least in my opinion, to have to be put in this category for us to adapt when there is a lot of us. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, actually, uh, that brings me to another point. You mentioned earlier you know, that you were born in Mexico, and so uh, these sorts of ideas were, were very different there, um, if not at all really uh, relevant or existent to you. It's just you, you were just a person. Uh, but coming to you know, the United States, uh, how was that transition for you? What, what sort of, uh, what, what was that experience like? Um, it was very shocking to learn that the United States doesn't have an official language. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I feel like I have to, you know, I have to uh, learn English um, and that I have to you know, constantly uh, improve the lexicon and so on and so forth. Uh, but I think that was the biggest part, you know, like learning the language so I could survive. And, and as, uh, as I go further into my academic studies to see the hierarchy of like English on top and like Spanish at the bottom when there's a lot of us who speak Spanish in the country, you know, and then us being a Hispanic sort of institution is just a constant awareness of, again, of everything that have, we have been taken advantage of. Well, yeah, yeah, that we've been, been taken advantage of because we, I, uh, immigrants run the country. We run the country. Um, so just, just coming to terms as an adult, it is challenging, you know, that we, we keep it going, we keep it alive, and we bring the sabor, and we bring the party, and, yeah, I, I'm glad to have these, these spaces. Yeah. All right, well, this is going by a little too quick for, for this. There's so much more uh, that I wanted to, to touch on that um, I don't think we're going to be able to get to today. So if I could just ask, uh, going from this direction to this direction, if we could just get some final thoughts from everyone on um, maybe some of the things we've already talked about and what we should talk about going forward. Yeah, you know, at the end of the road for me, just to be incredibly blunt, uh, all these westernized constructions of imperial control mean absolutely nothing except the way we understand differences between unity and solidarity. Yep. If we want to understand Latinidad for a movement, then we look at the role solidarity, or to use your words, right, this idea of sabor and what connects us. But that doesn't mean that we need to or have to agree with everything. At the end, Hispanic-centric colonialism is just another or a cousin to Anglo-centric colonialism. They're both European imperialistic, acculturative, and assimilative uh, tactics and movements uh, uh, for, you know, to, to, for, for cultural genocide and takeover. So we want to take the conversation somewhere. Uh, let's get real about deconstructing, uh, decolonizing, and remarking who we are in our own ways. Danny? Um, I think that was beautifully said, especially in professional uh, spaces. Mm -hmm. You know, I do feel like I have to wipe myself, off, like just whitewash myself when I walk into a professional space. Um, you know, and then my, my Latinidad and my Mexicanist comes out afterwards. Um, but it is, it is very conflicting and strange that I have to put, a, put up this front that is the standard, and then I have to let myself loose. And yeah, yeah there, there's a lot to deconstruct. There's a lot of work to do, work to do for us to show up genuinely in every space. Some reflections that I have um, is that, you know, Latinidad is in the people who are in Mexico, Central America, Latin America, Caribbean, we're not a monolith. 
and you can't use one term as a blanket term for everybody. Because as Dr. Benitez said, we're all so unique, we're all so special in our own ways, and to use, to try and find one like blanket word is, er is erasure, mm -hmm. and that's not okay. It's not okay. And so I would really ask everybody to think about the word that I use, why do I use it? Because uh, I had to think about that on my drive over. Why do I use it? Um, and I even learned some things from you. Um, so I appreciate that. That's yeah. <laughs> um, and I think that these conversations are important because it's how we exist in the world. It's how we show up and how we are even connected to our cultura sometimes. Um, and I'm glad to be here today. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you all so much for being here. I have learned so much. And, you know, despite the title of the show, I really do invite people here because I love to learn these things. I don't know them, you know. So uh, you all being here is really special to me. And I really hope that we can continue this conversation someday. But we are out of time. And uh, we've got to respect everybody who's given their time to the show today. So thank you all so much for joining us. I'd like to thank you all, my guests, for being here. I'd like to thank our production crew. Uh, for making time so early in the morning, so close to midterm. So thank you all. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, that's it for the show. And I hope we can continue this some other day. All right. Gracias. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Have a good night. <laughs>I'll just keep going. Guys, thank you so much for cool. being here. Yeah. Honestly, this okay. was uh, this is terrific. Yeah, we guy. can stretch out Let's now. Dance. Yeah, you can stretch out. No, it's, it's fascinating. It's, you know, a lot of people don't even talk about uh, Asian migrations and identities to Latin America. And people don't talk post-World War I, post-World War II, uh, East European migrations, hence 